you're logged into our YouTube and not yours, right? No, I know I am. I'm logged okay. in as you because it asks me every time it wants to. It just wants check to in. set. Just check in. Yeah, I know. Okay, me. It says meeting is now live streaming on YouTube. Yeah, now we are. Now we're now live. we are. Yep. I don't have the video yet, but I can see the live update. <clears throat> that is weird. Why does this live streaming thing do not Zoom? This app? Because see, that's the thing. You need the app to stream to more than one one at a time. Like if I just use the regular controls, I can only pick one thing. Like I could stream mm -hmm. to YouTube or I could stream to Twitch. But with this app, I can stream to like up to four things. Wow. I have and, to work on that. <laughs> and it's normally, like, cool for you? Yeah. I mean, streaming to the one app the way I have been. But, yeah, this um, live streaming app thing seemed cool <laughs> until it didn't work. One thing that's so annoying about YouTube is, like, it tells me that we're live, but it doesn't show the video right away and it's so annoying <clears throat> like get a move on here youtube well i can see our video so i know we're good does anybody else see it yet <laughs> <laughs> um i can never tell how any okay there's two people watching it's probably you and me ha <laughs> <laughs> well no we probably only count as one because of the zoom ah d marie's here <laughs> So what are those here? There we go. It's finally in there. Okay. Good <laughs> lord. Okay. What an ordeal. Yeah, that was stressful tonight. <laughs> Who does yeah. It's always something. <laughs> Nobody mind my 70s wood paneled wall. <laughs> Yeah, I always you you seem to always be there for AQSG meetings, so I always admire your wood paneling. <laughs> it did, Robin. It totally took forever hey, for things to like show up tonight. It was it was bizarre. Yeah, we had to restart. So yeah, I don't know if you got like a, a notification or this this is always a work in progress. <laughs> hey, at least we're not fighting with like Twitch guest star. I finally gave up on that. I, I would love for it to work. But yeah, at least we know like the thing that's not working is not like us showing up on the screen together. Yeah. So we can't at have least everything. Zoom. Yeah. At least Zoom kind of works though. So yeah. Well <laughs> too much wrong with 70s paneling. <laughs> I suppose so, Robin. This room is pretty dark. So before we get going, because, you know, people just, when they watch replays, they don't necessarily watch all at once or all the way through or anything. So at the top of the hour here, let's just put it on out there that next week's Book Talk Tuesday, which will be the 26th. Oh my God, the month's almost over. That's really scary. Um, I know. We'll be, we'll, we're still in quilt making in America and we'll be in the section many hands group quilting with an abstract of quilters in the 19th and early 20th centuries discovered the means for economic empowerment through the use of their needles whether to support themselves or to raise money for a cause Ooh, that's got the quest of benbury article mm -hmm. there's yeah. only two articles so i'm assuming they might be lengthy uh we'll oh well yeah, but I also think it's just a matter of these are just the two papers on Questus. Yeah, Questus paper looks pretty long. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, these are the two about making money. Mm -hmm. So, and then that last, the last ones are um, the 20th century. Hi, Janet. Yeah, it took a while for YouTube to like get a move on tonight. Yeah, I like, guess I guess it's YouTube. Maybe it was YouTube that Zoom no, it's was YouTube. trying to. It's totally YouTube because you're like, I can see that I'm live and I'm just sitting there. Guys, I'm literally sitting there going, refresh. <laughs> refresh <laughs> refresh <laughs> it's really frustrating when i can see that youtube says that the account is live but there's no video that's really annoying yeah that's annoying 
but we're here now. We are. Did you want to mention our next book again? Just Yes, I don't have it with me, but our next book is um, Antique American Needlework Tools by Don Cook Ronigan. Um, I have put in I, I, the last video, I'll put it again in this one. She does have, she is a, like a current author. This book is still put, you know, you can still get it new. You can get it from her directly on her Etsy site. So we do encourage you to buy directly from the author when it is possible, because a lot of the books we're buying, that's not possible. Uh, so please do go and support her because she's also going to be a guest when we're done with that book. So we will get yes. to talk to her directly. So we always want to make sure that we're supporting the places and the things and all that stuff. Yep. <laughs> And Yusuf, we shall overcome. <laughs> Tish, it's a really good book. I'm really glad that you like it. It's really, it really is. Isn't it? Like, it'll be a really yeah. nice, fun read after some of some of the heavierness of what we're reading now. So that's nice. I'll have a nice trade off. Yeah, and I'm putting the link. Um, this is directly to Don's um Etsy. Or the, the listing of the signed book. Let's see if it works for you. Because remember last time I was putting the link in and it like just didn't want to. Someone told me that YouTube hates links. Oh, probably. <laughs> if you do need to search, she is, let me put it in here. She's collector with a needle. Right. But it's not, it's kind of not how you expect it. It's collector WA needle. So oh yeah. On, can... on Etsy. Yeah. Yeah, if I can just nah, it's not let me do it. Oh, great, Janet. I'm so glad you got it, too. She's a good friend of ours, so she's excited to come. Yeah, I can't wait to talk to her. And I'm, <clears throat> I've never actually talked to her a whole lot about her books. I, I took one of her, um, her lecture on the, the subject rolls. of the second book, which is the sewing rolls. Like, I think you were there, too. Yeah. And, um. You know, she talked about all that. So kind of got that that wealth of her wisdom. But yeah, I never really talked to her about her other book. And it's like one of my favorite books. And um, I have, there, I guess there's a long story about I actually knew Dawn and didn't realize I knew her. <laughs> we could tell all that when we when we get to her book. But um, yeah, I, I'm uh, excited to talk to her about the book because it's very exciting. It's there's so many things in there that I saw that when so I first got the things. book that I recognize. And then now since I kind of go back to it as I find like little needlework tchotchkes and stuff or see things online or whatever, I go back to her book to say like, Oh, that's what that is. Or, you know, yeah, whatever. No, the, only, the only bummer for me is that I wish it could, the book cover could have been hardcover because I open it so frequently. I'm like, <laughs> I, I need to get another one. Cause like, I'm going to totally wreck this. <laughs> You need to go get it spiral bound. <laughs> yeah, well, but even still, even spiral bound though, like you can, you know, you can still do some damage to a, a cover of a book that you're just destroying. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> this is true. From okay. Overlevels. <clears throat> well, are we ready to get to it? We are ready to get to it. So just based on a, like a one sentence text today, I learned that you were disappointed in the first <laughs> in Sue Ellen Meyer's paper about the sewing machine so it's funny so I text Steph and told her like you know I wasn't really happy with this and she you know because blah 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 and she's like you know I liked it and I was like let the disagreements begin like, <laughs> so. I just like I mean you know I know you were looking for something that was more about sewing on quilts with the sewing machine I just I mean I just really liked the the whole article and I mean or the paper in general about you know, just, just the machine, you know, the sewing machine showing up in women's lives and, and what that was like. So it's not that I dislike the article. I just, based on getting going, I expected it to be more about machine quilting on quilts and less about just generalized sewing machine history. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause I, I, I think more than half of it is about that. Um, that's that's really my only thing. It's just I expected it to be more about 
the actual machine quilting. Gotcha. Well, you know, <clears throat> I kind of had a question just, you know, I mean, it's a rhetorical question, but, you know, I often wonder how often people see quilts or quilt tops and automatically assume that they're newer than they are because of mis machine stitching. Oh, for sure. I'm, I'm so guilty of that too. <laughs> I, I yeah. am. I'm like, as soon as I see my, like, so I just have this like cognitive dissonance that that's just like my brain does not want to comprehend s machine sewing pre-1900 and I know it's a thing like of course it's a thing mm -hmm. and I have machines that are older than 1900 like in my personal possession but right. I, I don't know why I just maybe because it's so long ago I have a, like this hard time comprehending it especially but it made a lot of sense to me um like further in the article where she mentions that there's far more quilts and tops that are machine pieced than are actually mm -hmm. machine quilted. And I was like, yes, that actually yes. makes, I actually wonder if the article had been about that instead of machine quilting, she probably would have been able to have a whole lot more to say because there'd be a lot more source material. Cause she, you know, she flat out says it's pretty rare to find the machine quilted. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I was like, well, like, yeah, that's true. And I know that. And I see that all the time. But I still can't put it in my brain. I yeah, know. yeah. Well, you know, and I think I think probably what's really also challenging for, you know, especially you, you look at a lot of quilts. The fact that you sometimes have, like, and those of you that were apologized, this was, if you were on my stream yesterday, you already know about this quilt. But this quilt, the the blocks were pieced by my great-grandmother. The quilt itself was constructed by my grandmother. And we're talking like 35 years apart. Or more. 45 years apart, I think. Um, yeah, like 45 years apart. And so, when you, but when I look at this, like there are fabrics that are probably like predate 1947 when she pieced these blocks. And so it's kind of a question of like, if I didn't have the history of this quilt, this is a confusing quilt, right? <laughs> because of all that. So... I mean, how often do we look at quilts and say like, well, this fabric is like, you know, 1880s, you know, this fabric's turn of the century. Oh, but there's machine piecing. So, you know, and I mean, how we could just be so wrong sometimes, I guess, <laughs> is what I'm saying. You know, you really, I guess, have to look at the fabric. That's the only way to date it when you're, you know, it looks well, old. And then even, I mean, even generally people that are dating stuff now, there's... There's never any guarantees that any of them are right unless you're doing carbon dating mm -hmm. on things. Yeah, And even yeah. then, there's still a very wide range of dates put in there to, to account for error. So, Yes, I'm um, going to need that carbon dating quilt for, I mean, carbon dating uh, kit for all of my quilts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. When my archaeology professor, like, first was introducing us to the world of carbon dating, he immediately made a joke about dating like actual dating it was awkward oh gosh i don't even want to know <laughs> but anywho so a couple things in here that surprised me one was that singer really didn't give a dang about sewing machines oh <laughs> he just wanted to make some dough and he was like all right <laughs> i have his um I don't know where it went. It was right here on the table. I have the book about him. Okay. That I've yeah. been that I've been reading. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm getting Stephanie gave me her plague through through cyberspace. It's, aller it's allergy season. I'm not gonna take um, the responsibility for all of that. <laughs> yeah, I've been slowly reading his like a biography about him. And I say slowly because it's kind of boring. Um, but like he was a, not a good person. <laughs> Like, well i mean it sounds like it i mean she says she says right here singer had no interest in easing women's burdens <laughs> no well he was like a womanizer for one but yeah really he, and he was mm, yeah he was he was like as janet just says singer was a piece of work janet that's really the nicest way you could put it <laughs> <laughs> but but i mean like his name endures today i mean people that don't like i mean even people who sew but you don't get into the minutiae of antique sewing machines i mean you know that's like a whole world um 
you know, you say, hey, sewing machine to a lot of people, even if they sew, they're like, oh, yeah, singer. Like, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> I actually what horrible people of today will still have their game on things 200 years from now? <laughs> I um uh, probably a lot of them. I actually really kind of take pride in the fact that like, eh, maybe he's he's rolling around in there because he's all angry about the the singers of today and how terrible well, maybe the best part is nobody remember you singer except for sewing machines that eased women's burdens so take that <laughs> <laughs> hey you're just actually, known for it, sewing machines i mean if it wasn't for sewing machines there wouldn't be near as many wealthy women out there this is true this mm -hmm, is true mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so next thing that okay so Singer being a turd was, okay, surprising. But what really blew me away was uh, Elias Howe, $2 million without ever manufacturing a single sewing machine. Did you not already know that beforehand? I did not know that. Oh, I, see, um, I this, expected that you knew more history than that. Well, see, that's the thing. I mean, yes, I, I'm into antique sewing machines because I like them and I like tinkering with them. But I really don't know a lot of this history. Oh, okay. It's just, you know, I know like I... You know, I know you've kind of gone down rabbit holes because you have a bunch of machines. I know our friend Mia, she's like goes down the rabbit holes because she has, you know, she's big in machines too. But I mean, I have machines. I don't have a lot of them. You know, I, I just like them more for, Wait, you know, just. You don't have a lot of them? I don't really. Not compared to you. <laughs> oh, because I was going to say, how come you're always telling me you don't have any more room when I'm trying to pawn them off uh, on you? Because I truly don't have room. <laughs> The trunk of my car only holds so many. <laughs> I hope you, I hope everyone's enjoying my minion cup, by the way. I was wondering <laughs> what was on that cup. Yeah, it's just water, not booze. Maybe it should be booze, but like, have a minion day. <laughs> but this, this whole scheme of each company contributing $15 and sharing the money equally and then how getting $5, like, that's amazing to me, like, that they... They created this whole scheme and that how made that much money. I mean, what <laughs> I'd have to do the math. I guess there's enough enough data there to do the math. But I mean, how much do these other people make? See, you know, Singer, Wheeler, Wilson and Grover and Baker. Like, wow. Oh, my goodness. This consortium, this consortium yeah, had a lot like of money. Millions and millions and millions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I also love the fact, this is like one of my favorite quotes in here. <clears throat> the company combated two entrenched myths held by Victorian men. First, oh, thought... that women women couldn't control machinery. And second, that freed from some of their arduous labors, women would go wild. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wrote that down too. <laughs> Just you wait, gentlemen. <laughs> hey, Jan. <laughs> um... um. Yeah, you ahead. know what's funny is <clears throat> on page 116 the you know quoting saying by 1865 women had made 250,000 quilts and comforts for union soldiers many of them probably pieced by machine and when we were talking about the civil war articles and just the vast majority mm -hmm. of quilts that they made here I am I did not have it in my brain that they were using machines to make them. Here I am going, wow, they pieced 250,000 quilts together all by hand. <laughs> yeah, but still, even with sewing machines, that's a lot of work, you know, and, oh, and no, they were is, not just making quilts been... and comforts. They were making their uniforms, <laughs> their shirts. Like well, no, everything. but the point is, like, a shirt, right, was four, 14 to 16 hours of labor pre-machine and then two right, hours. Yeah post machine so it again it's that thing where like my brain just like won't comprehend and i'm it's like it's one of those well of course they were piecing them with machines like how on earth yeah. could you get there's, that many yeah. there's no way that you could you cannot aid the war effort doing things by hand except maybe knitting you know they they did a lot of knitting civil war and world war one I, I guess in world war ii as well but um yeah, you you just couldn't create that volume of of things that the soldiers needed if you didn't mm -hmm. have a machine. So that part I was not surprised by. Mm -hmm. Um, Tish said housewives so that... gone wild. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds that sounds like a really good um, title for a study center. 
about like Victorian women and what happened when the sewing machine came out. Like <laughs> Housewives gone wild. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. The chain stitch that had to be tied off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think somebody I know had a chain stitch machine and yeah, like, Oh, that's a bad deal. Cause if you just pulled up <laughs> that thread, it's like zip, <laughs> the whole seam comes undone. <laughs> Um, but back on page 14, couple 114, a couple other things I wanted to mention. Um, so the piece in the the, the um, column on the, the right-hand side of page 114, um, they're talking about that even a child can manage it. Well, so first of all, um, I mean, any of you, if you've never tried to sew on a treadle, it is an absolute nightmare the first time you try it because you're like, ah! <laughs> um, but also this piece about here, I mean, like even a child can manage it. And I mean, this is just such a precursor to the idea of like, we're going to have children in mills very soon. <laughs> you know, we're going to have to this child labor making, you know, what is it? The, uh, the, oh, the shirt, the shirt factory. Sweatshops. Um, yeah. Like that kind of stuff is like, oh yeah. Children, so easy. Ch well, great. Take your children from the farm send them to the mills and the, the sweatshops, which, I mean, we really do pick up in the next. That's, I mean, that's, yeah, that's where we're going next. <laughs> exactly. And then down towards the end of here, I, and now I know I've heard this, this figure before, but it's, it never ceases to surprise me where it says that machines were about $125. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I mean, like, and I think, did she say that in here? Like, that's pretty much like a car. That's like buying a car. It's, it's yeah. a big deal. It's a huge purchase. Yeah. And then on the next page where he talks about Edward Clark, coming up with this like rent to own situation yeah leasing <laughs> you know and um i mean we we see that layaway the whole concept of layaway or um what were those i don't even know if they have these places anymore those rent to own like showrooms where you could go get your tv oh the furniture and... yeah i don't know if they do that anymore but i remember when oh. i was a kid i was like <laughs> why don't we do that and my dad was like because we'd end up paying eight million dollars for a tv <laughs> but I mean, I just, it's, it's interesting to me when you think of that as such like a 20th century thing. Um, but you know, the fact that they were doing that back then was like really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's basically like one of the first concepts of credit. <clears throat> what else you got? Um, from there. Mm -hmm. I found it interesting that <clears throat> she suggests that as many as 10% of all the quilts during the periods of 1865 to 1900 um, bear some kind of machine applique or quilting on it. Mm -hmm. One, I don't, I don't necessarily know how you come up with any kind of figure. Um, but um, I, what I find interesting is I I definitely come across more machine applique than quilting. Um, and I would, I would just guess because, I mean, the quilting, I mean, even on a, like a domestic machine that does not have like a, you know, what the, the slip differential or a walking foot or, you know, all of that technology. Um, it's difficult. You're going to get a messy back <laughs> if you don't have good control of that. And I mean, I know you could free motion on really any kind of machine. No, they I definitely, guess. they had attachments that they created, like mm -hmm. they had a hoop and everything. That and little springy thing. Yeah. Yeah. They could, they I just think it's did it some was, embroidery. Yeah. I just think it was just so much more difficult. You know, I mean, we were lucky today to have, you know, obviously long arms, but even domestic machines that are made for quilting, you know, there's stitch regulation and all that stuff. And, and you drop your feed dog so you don't get that. But I, I can see like with early machines, what a nightmare trying to feed, you know, a full quilt through there. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that have read Florence Petto's book or listened along with me, um, the lobster was this well-known quilt on Long Island that was like the shame of the community because not only did she piece it and applique it, with a sewing machine and did a real shitty job <laughs> she also quilted it and it was like and she was proud of it the woman that made it was so proud of it because she's like we got the, i'm the first one with the sewing machine here in long island i made this quilt look at me and everybody was like she made it with a sewing machine <laughs> you know and that's kind of the next thing that i had had marked here in this 
this paper is that, you know, upon first getting machines, women were excited to try it out, right? Mm -hmm. And you're saying you're seeing applique. Applique was probably easier to do and piecing, obviously, easier to do than quilting itself. But then on page 118, she starts talking about, you know, by the end of the century, machine quilting had become déclassé in fashionable circles. Mm -hmm. And um, this woman, Sybil Lanigan, is said to have said, the worst way of all is to use a sewing machine. And we still see that today. I mean, they had the quilt police back in the 1800s. That was like bottom line what I wanted to say. Like, um, you know, when my mom started quilting in, I mean, I think it was literally the year after I was born. She told me the other day and she said, oh, yeah. So like when she first joined a guild, women were looking down their nose at her like, you did. How did you piece those on a sewing machine? <laughs> you know, and like we see that a little bit today too you know well I remember stories about I don't know what year it was someone in the chat might know if there's if there's a Mary Kay floating around or a Barb Garrett um I do remember stories about the first year that a machine quilted quilt won like best of show at Paducah and people oh were yeah 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 people lost their minds and it yeah, was wait. it was probably like not that long ago too <laughs> I want to say it was like the what, like the seventies or eighties or something. I'm yeah, saying, right? I was gonna say the eighties is my guess, yeah. but yeah, yeah, that's uh... yeah. The yes, you're absolutely right, John. That the the space, your uh, your sp Rena Center. That's what I was sure <laughs> they do still exist. <laughs> also, like since you're on page eighteen, can we also just like take yes. a minute? I know, looking quilt. at that that thing, yeah, ninety four by ninety four. I mean, what an amazing thing. So um, no batting, right? It didn't have batting, but. No. And, and, and like they, they, she says in here, so she says, piece quilt made by Sally Jane Ed Edmiston Woodward, 1843 to 1925 of Iridale County, North Carolina, circa 1870. The incredible quilt of 5,810 pieces is machine quilted without batting. It must have been difficult enough to control the machine stitches over the seams. In the center of the quilt, Sally appliqued a patch with the number 15, eight, or 5, 8, 10, uh, embroidered in double rows of chain stitch. It's I'm going to assume she did that by hand. I don't know. Um, oh, Mary, yeah. Mary Kay is in the chat. Mary yeah. Kay's in the house. So Mary Kay, Deb Wagner, is that who, is that who won Best of Show with the machine quilting? Oh, was yeah. Is that who it was? I'll have to look her quilt do you up. Know, and if it is, do you know when it was? <laughs> Let's see. Mara Dem says, follow a YouTube channel of a guy who did free motion quilting using a treadle. 1989. So that's Robin. <clears throat> I was three years old. Uh, I was in high school. <laughs> Way to make me feel old. That's um, okay. That's okay. You're so in your 20s now. It's all good. <laughs> okay, so to wrap this paper up, two things I wanted to mention. First of all, I had no idea Harriet Powers used a sewing machine on the Bible Me quilt. Me too. That I was, was like, like one of the last things I wrote. Yeah, I mean, the fact that, I mean, we've seen kind of close-up pictures from one of the quilt nerds that saw it, took pictures and shared them. And I remember, like, you know, holding my face to the computer screen to see her close-up pictures. And it just never occurred to me that if I saw what looked like machine applique, it just never registered. So, so I, will, um, I will tell you that I don't remember reading about it at the exhibit, but at least how it was exhibited at the MFA, they had those bad boys behind glass. Yes, like, I do know that. Yeah, but I you, remember you couldn't yeah, even get like that, close to them. The person that took the picture, she kind of leaned herself. She took like a selfie with it. And I think it was hard to see like the, the how big things were because of the weird angle she was at. But well, she also yeah, must so have had a really good camera lens because they were mm -hmm. um they almost look like they were in an aquarium, kind of how that's how aquariums are set up and you sit in yeah. front of it. They had it like behind glass because it wasn't just theirs. Remember, our exhibit also had the Smithsonian's one. Mm -hmm. It was the first time in what, some how many years they'd been together. But they were together. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, They had them behind there, semi-tilted, and it was a good, probably at least a good foot away from, from the glass. Interesting. So, yeah, I feel so like you when couldn't the, get that close, the... even if you wanted to. 
at the skirball, I think that it was it was similar, even closer. Yeah, oh, I feel like the person that that took pictures, they were able to get a little bit closer to it, Maybe. although it was behind glass. So, <laughs> Maybe. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say in here is just what I thought was just an oddball thing. It says toward the end of the century, many quilt makers pieced baskets by hand and applique the handles by machine. So, I would do the opposite. <laughs> I would piece it all and then do that because, you know, it's just the handle and it's curved. <laughs> so I actually have the blue basket quilt that's for sale on my site right now is one of those. Interesting. Yep. I'll have to go back and look at that. Mm -hmm. So Google her name, Deborah Wagner. Okay. We'll have to, we're going to have to look at that. So 1990, 89 or 90. Okay. So maybe if she, what did she finish it? Maybe in 89 and then it was judged in 90. Interesting. We're going to have to look that up and get the details. Can we move? Since Mary Kay's here, let's move to her paper. Let's go on. Mary Kay, you're on the spot now. <clears throat> so first of all, this whole topic has always been confusing for me. Me too. <laughs> and I'm glad, I'm glad to have read Mary Kay's paper about it. Um, and I do love the comment here. Why was this fabric not called cotton z woolsey? <laughs> <laughs> We love that, Mary Kay. That was very funny. That was very, that, that's very you. Um, so yeah, like, let's, let's talk about this. I mean, it's, it's, it's such an interesting fabric. Um, um, well, before we get started here, let's just admire this mm -hmm. lovely quilt that's yes. the collection of Mary Kay. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, what's funny is with the whole Lindsay Woolsey Kalamenko, it's confusing. I recently sold a quilt that is that lazy type wool that it, it's funny when I listed it, our friend Amy Barrick messaged me and she's like, you know, I wonder if that might be Kalamenko. And it's one of those like, I don't know enough about it to say one way or another. It's the first time I'd ever encountered, encountered that. Mm -hmm. um but now the more I've learned I'm like it, it was definitely wool um I'm kind of bummed I don't have it in my hands now because then we could have like, <laughs> to look at it closer yeah, again. uh because man it, it did sell quickly um and it was green and brown obviously we can look at pictures of it but um yeah you know I just I, I don't I don't well, know. This this is a confusing one for me. But I mean, is Kalamanka or Kalamanka, is, is that all wool or is that wool and cotton? Like, is that the same thing as? It's, I don't know. I mean, Mary Kay, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm understanding it is yeah, kind of. Mary Kay is saying wool. Lindsay is a regional thing. And mm -hmm. I definitely got that from, um, mm -hmm. from her paper. Um, I get, you know, outside of the pictures, I guess I just, I struggle. Cause I'm like, I, I've maybe never seen this stuff in like in person. Um, you know, because I mean, I've maybe just not seen quilts that 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 had this. Um, Interesting. Mary Kay said green on one side, brown on the other. I, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know since it was made. Oh, it's all wool. Well, I guess we can go home. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. And I did. Yes. And I did see. Yes. Because there was that piece in here where she talked about. um testing the fabric and and it it is all it was all wool um mm -hmm. so yeah that I guess that's the question I mean when you have something like this you almost have to do some fiber testing if it's not super obvious you know I I guess in my mind I will so these these petticoats these um you can kind of see you know the the yeah. sort of white, like it's almost like a shot cotton is sort of what it reminds me of. Like, and I, you know, I mean, I realize it's probably also really faded, but if the, <clears throat> the cotton warp, right. Yeah. The cotton warp is white. And then you've got the weft is, you know, a colored wool. It It's just got that shot cotton look. And so I'm kind of wondering, like, have I seen this stuff before? And just assumed like, oh, what a cool shot cotton, <laughs> you know? Well, that's what I'm wondering too, because at um where <laughs> um <clears throat> I don't think I'm I don't think I'm confusing another article. At some point, I believe Mary Kay, you mentioned homespun. Yes. And and half of me was like, 
so I'm, if I'm correct, if I understand correctly, all Lindsay is homespun, but not all homespun is Lindsay. Yes. I would think if it's all true. kind of like a, in a, like, that's kind of how I'm understanding that. And then, and then it also just tells me for when I'm like, oh, God, there's a lot that I don't know about this. <laughs> Yes, she, she says, remember the quilt on the cover of the Kentucky uh -huh. Quilts book? Yeah, that yeah. it's that, it's sort of red and green. Yeah. I, yes, I remember, you did well, mention that's that. That's like you, right. Yeah, that's here in this. this yeah, paper. you did mention that in here. Yeah. I just mm -hmm. don't have the Kentucky book handy. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was reading this. I was reading the paper last night in bed and I was like, oh, I need to grab that book. Um, but yes, we definitely saw it when we were in Kentucky last year, um, that book. Um, I think it was, wasn't the picture was taken from the book and used and some, some, some of the marketing materials, I yeah, think, or yeah. that, that quote. Yeah. Yes. So Mary said, Mary Kay said, correct. She'd say that like all Lindsay's homespun, but not all homespun is Lindsay. And you know, what makes me upset is wasn't in Kentucky, wasn't there a study center at seminar, a QSG seminar for anyone that doesn't know, <clears throat> wasn't there a, a study center on homespun? I feel like there was. Maybe. <laughs> I can't remember now. I've like, I look at way too many events now and, and workshops and stuff and can't remember. Yeah, no, Mary Kay just said, right. Yes, there was a, there was a study center on homespun and I really wanted to take it. <clears throat> I may not have been able to stuff because it might've been the same time that your lecture was. There was a reason I couldn't take it. It was either your lecture was at that time or we were on a trip. I forget which, mm -hmm. but I was, I was really hoping that that was going to show up in the winter seminar the winter session yeah and it didn't and i was bummed because i i really i don't know enough about homespun and i really need to know more about it because i find that often when i'm out buying i tend to shy away from it because i don't understand it and what a shame well yeah. you know what i mean like well here <laughs> you have some <laughs> intel <laughs> and you kind of know the, the lady who wrote this paper <laughs> Um, yeah, I, yeah, like, again, like, I just, I, I feel like I'd have to, like, see it in person and have somebody tell me, that is Lindsay, what you were looking at. Um, because I, I think just even looking at the pictures, I'm looking, I mean, these are beautiful old quilts, these are beautiful old petticoats. Um, well, I think I, it would I think also, um, oh, Mary Kay went to it. Ah, folks, folks in New England don't, really, don't know really know Lindsay, Lindsay, of, the Lindsay of the South. Okay. So homespun of the North would just be like what, you know, you just know it's homespun. Home, home loomed fabrics. Mary Kay, where would you maybe say would be the best place to go that has the best collection of Lindsay quilts, if you know? While we're waiting on her to to uh to let you know that page one twenty eight, I just wanted to point out where they talk about William Grasty, Grasty, um, I say they, or Mary Kay points out, <laughs> uh, William Grasty took over a general store in Mount Airy, Virginia, in eighteen thirty eight. Mm -hmm. Mount Airy, Virginia, is in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I knew I'd heard of it, and I I thought I kind of knew where it was, so I looked it up on the map. And um, it is it is where I thought it was. Um, but the list of dry goods in his inventory, including fabrics, this is like an amazing amount of fabric. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> A person living in Mount Airy, Virginia today would probably have to drive like an hour <laughs> to get to a store that even sold like Joanne fabrics, like, the, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's, they, they, we just today do not have access to all of these different kinds of fabrics. Um, but also it's just amazing to me that this tiny town, you know, had, had this documentation of these dry goods that they have that you cannot get in that tiny town today, for sure. I just thought that was well, really interesting. Well, to be fair, it's probably stock that accumulated over a couple of years. <laughs> Oh, and, uh, okay. So Mary Kay has 16 or so, so we just need to go look at her collection. Yeah, I was going to say, like, field trip to Mary Kay's house. <laughs> yeah, so Tish is bringing up, and we probably should have mentioned this as we started talking about the paper, um, the name Lindsay coming from the town in England, or the area in England, where um, those plain weaves were, make, were made. Let's see if we can find out where it says it. Um, 
So she says, it, it is possible the name Lindsay persisted long after the fabric composition changed because it came to be associated with an inexpensive plain weave fabric produced in the parish of Lindsay in Suffolk, England. <clears throat> so I guess that's the, the guess as to why Lindsay just kept being like <clears throat> a term that, that applied. Because no one wanted to use cottonsy woolsey. <laughs> Which I think is a better name. Um, <laughs> um, P.S., like Mary Kay said, come on down. Y'all heard it here first. So witnesses that she invited <laughs> us down. Yes. Yeah, so Mary Kay's husband's going to be like, who are you? Why are you here? <laughs> we'll be like, uh, um, look, she said we can go. So I love the part. So this is on page 130. I'm kind of skipping ahead um, where she talks about the um, the homespun parties. And this is all like, I guess, around the Civil War period. Mm -hmm. um, but even into, I guess, the early 1900s, like, we've got this lady writing this little um, little pillow that she stitched with this this poem. Um, what's really interesting is this whole idea of like pride in homespun did not just happen during the Civil War. It also, or around the Civil War, it also happened around the Revolution. And if you are familiar, familiar with this book, my copy is in a place I couldn't get to it. <laughs> I, I said that the other day. I've got like a bookshelf over there that's blocked that I need to move things around. But the book is called An Agreeable Tyrant, and it is available at the DAR Museum Shop. Um, but it's about clothing after the Revolutionary War. And it was a really big deal to wear homespun to prove like we have freed ourselves from, you know, the oh. tyrants of Britain and this terrible, you know, tariffs and all that. And we're going to make our, you know, make our, our fabrics at home and we're going to wear them. And like George Washington, like wore some like, <laughs> I just picture some crazy raggedy, like homespun, weird looking like suit but yeah like supposedly... stuff like stuff you would have like had to go to school in and be like my mom made me wear this it's got big collar <laughs> it's got <Yeah>. ruffles <laughs> um but yeah so that was like a big deal during like after the revolutionary war so i see it like as this this is interesting how this idea of of homespun fabric kind of comes back over the years as something that's important and Mary Kay that says like, that's why really she got cloth. really into this cloth. Yeah. I yeah. Could see oh, like Paisley. Could, I could see where you could go on a big deep dive. Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh, like geez. <laughs> and, and, and this, and I only am just saying that just now, it really, it really didn't, it wasn't on my radar so much before. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I'm really enjoying about. Right. AQSG yeah. putting together this collection of essays is how many things were not on my radar and I get to touch so many of them in one Exactly. Book. Yes. And like the gunboats. Like I just totally did not remember. Well, I think I probably wasn't at that episode of Quiltner when Mary talked about the gunboats. But yes. I mean, how much of history have I learned from reading this stuff and in, in, in some of the other books that I've read for my stream? Yeah. Like I, I feel like I've become a much better you know, just general historian about things that I should have probably learned in, in school and I just didn't pay attention because it was boring. <laughs> but in this context, it's fascinating, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess it's only right where Mary Kay is. Actually, Mary Kay, you might be right. If you've got 16 in your collection, it might only be right where <laughs> you, you might, are. <laughs> yeah, you might have the biggest collection. <laughs> yes, Dolly, Dolly Madison and her coat of many colors. Yep. <laughs> I remember reading Lancaster about that. Lancaster City. Oh my God, where's Barb? She's going to school you. It's Lancaster County. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too funny. Actually, I haven't yeah, seen but that. That's interesting that she mentions Paisley. Paisley is is the other thing that we know. We think of Paisley as the, the shape, but that actually came from a place in, was it Wales or Scotland or? I don't know. Then that design then went to India and became like such a common print, you know, as they're producing chintz and other, um, you know, fabrics. And then it comes back, you know, as this import as Paisley fabric. But the name of it actually came. It, they were like shawl makers, I think. I can't remember. <laughs> Mary Kay, you're getting too excited. Oh, totally you're, trying to type, you're trying to type too fast. I said Dolly Madison. I meant Dolly Parton. <laughs> No, but Mary Kay kept mis misspelling it Dolly Pardon. I'm sure that's probably either finger type or <laughs> um, autocorrect because she's probably too excited. 
Oh, Scotland. Cool. Paisley's from Scotland? Yes, yeah, Scotland. Okay, yeah. I love it's, Paisley, Paisley is a town in Scotland. Oh, basically. I never knew yeah. that. I love me. Yep. I love me some Paisley. Love um, and also, can I just say, like, can we, like, I want to have a homespun party. Do you, by wearing homespun clothing or by making it? I don't know. Like, no, like, can we have, like, can we have, like, a a party <laughs> we're making mary Kay crazy girl it's what we're here to do um no i want to like have a party like make it you know like you're like you're um you know making your own batting there you know like experimental archaeology here like okay I mean, the wheels turning i can tell you're like that might be kind of cool i'm well i'm thinking am i gonna have to get go get myself a, a loom <laughs> <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what you're what you're expecting out of a, a homespun party, but we'll well you can buy those little we'll come tiny around tabletop to ones now. Yeah, we'll come around to it. I have a little tiny Martha Stewart. Loom. Oh, I have one of those uh, potholder looms. <laughs> I don't. I think we might need something a little more sophisticated. You know, like like 1860s sophisticated. <laughs> but yeah. let me noodle on that. Let me noodle on that. Noodle on it. Um, okay so how's your, how's your noodling well we want to definitely hey Kamo. <laughs> i All really right, so wanna... i really liked this just one last point oh it's yeah just i like the way mary Kay you put this Lindsay quilts are a unique response to particular circumstances i like that a lot mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> i think sometimes we're not necessarily always thinking about inventions or ways of making things mm -hmm. in the sense of how what are they responding to and how are they responding to them right like yeah exactly like why did why did they have this thing and it doesn't exist anymore like why did it exist at that period in time for what purpose yeah i mean that's really part of material culture isn't it like i mean that's that's one of the biggest questions you ask is like why was this thing invented why do we use it that way why is it gone now Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you so much mary kate that was a really interesting article yeah. like yeah, i really i've said before i'll say it again like i really need that rainbow there like the more you know <laughs> i sure. think maybe we need to make like a hat stuff make little hats for it <laughs> like the, the rainbow like or like a headband i'm on it <laughs> right after i figure out that homespun party <laughs> We could do it at the homespun party. All right, let's let's learn right. about the mills. So Laurel Horton. Okay, so I have a very close connection with the mills in South Carolina. Oh, yeah. My a lot of my family worked at the mills and the bleacheries. Really? Mm -hmm. Yes. Like, how um, many? Well, they're all over South Carolina. <laughs> they go from the low country to the Piedmont to up country. My grandmother grew up in up country. And I mean, it was a farming area. And like my grandmother, so my grandmother's father died when she was two. She's the youngest of seven kids, six kids, seven, I think. Anyway, so they had to, they had to make a decision. And this is 1927. This is like on the precipice of things getting really bad. Um, and things were already tough in the 20s. You know, just because we hear about the stock market crash, that doesn't mean that things were, were great until that point. Things in the 20s were rough in this area of the world. And um, as these mills are starting up, you know, they you are getting mill towns. I think the mill towns were bigger in the Piedmont than they were like where my grandmother lived. Um but there was a lot of like they she talks about the mill recruiters. Yeah, they would come around my uh, my grandmother's middle brother. He was recruited to drop out of high school and go work for the mill. And he later on was like crying to my great grandmother, like, why did you let me do that? And she's like, what? <laughs> I'm going to keep a 16 or 17 year old boy home when the mill recruiters are promising them all this money. Like, you know, you did this yourself, <laughs> you know, because he didn't have a high school diploma because he'd gone to work for the mill. Um, so, yeah, a lot of this story, I was like, even though she's talking about the 1800s and a lot of this beginning part of the paper, I like very much I was reading things and I'm like, uh-huh, I've heard these stories for sure. Um, so it's interesting. Um, I don't love the mills because they did bad things to our family. 
they are what they are. <laughs> um, she talks about uh, on page 137, um, local, let's see, um, mill workers used swatches of discarded mill ends as grease rags or sweat rags, and some women salvaged these and washed them for their quilts. Some women salvaged those and clothed their entire families. Like, that is how my great-grandmother made clothing for all of her grandchildren and some of her children. How much do you know about this, about your family history for it? All the stories that my grandmother told. I mean, oh, that's what I know. Have you ever considered, like, writing them down? I have. I've written down what I know. I mean, a lot of it is incomplete just because it was, you know, her stories. I, her, all of her siblings are deceased. I mean, there's there's only a few people that were kind of in her age range that are still alive, unfortunately. Um, but so, yeah, a lot of this is just anecdotal. But, yeah, the story about washing the rags, apparently the mills near her. And now this was like a day's journey <laughs> down the side of the mountain. Kind of th not really, but um, you know, she would have to go to town. You know, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't just like hopping in the car and driving five minutes. It was like go to town, and she would collect all of this, these fiber, you know, this fiber stuff that was coming out of the mill and bring it home, and <laughs> you know, on the the washboard until it was clean enough to be made into clothes for the children. And I mean, she made quilts with it too. And then, unfortunately, there was a house fire, so we have none of it. <laughs> oh I yeah see. that's that's really the sad piece of it too I, is and that you we, mentioned that before i believe right mm -hmm. yeah we lost yeah. a lot um <clears throat> so anyway this whole story like a lot of this just reading this i was just like oh like yeah <laughs> like totally get all this stuff the factory town all the or the yeah the factory mill town kind of stuff the mill recruiters um poor farmers see that's and as i was saying i, I think i kind of like kind of digressed but you know you got situations in the 20s before the stock market bust where, you know, they, they did have crop yield issues in the 20s. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my even before he passed away, my great grandfather was a poor farmer <laughs> and then he left this farm to his wife, you know, when he died and she was a poor farmer's wife for the rest of her life. Um, but it was very tantalizing for these people to walk away from their farms where that were not producing funds, especially come the actual depression, um, to go work for these mills because they were promising all of this stuff. And I, I, I suspect, like, you know, I don't know a whole lot about coal mining, but mm -hmm. I suspect in other places where you had industries with factory or, or mill towns, like those kind of communities, um, you know, farming was... I mean, farming is very transactional. You can definitely have bad years where your family is starving. Um, and so to be sort of lured into the mill, um, you know, was, was it was tantalizing for people to say like, oh, I'm going to have like a regular wage, you know, and they were and offering, I guess, in regular time. work. So there's mm -hmm. even with its major issues, there's some level of stability. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, in, in some of these times were real boom times and the real boom times, it seems like in reading Laurel's paper here were before 1900 because of all of the economic stuff, you know, that was going on um, in the country. But then the, there is this other sort of boom when you get into the world wars. Mm -hmm. So like World War II, that's where a lot of my like my grandmother's um, nieces and nephews who are all about her age. So and if she would be she would be 99 this year. So it would be people kind of in that, that age bracket now, if they're still living, they're in their nineties. Um, but they, they would have been kind of recruited for the world war II era of the mills. So the boot cotton mills in Lowell, um, which is the oldest mill in Lowell, they have a, um, they, they play a video in there where they're interviewing mm -hmm. people of that age, because I think shortly after World War II is when a lot of them started to close. Is yeah. it not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then like up until and the I 70s, think it, so they're interviewing it all It took people. longer. Yeah. I think it took longer in the South than it did in the North. I want to say that, and I could be wrong about that, but I want to say like in the North, things started to close down earlier than they did in the South. Um, because there were some major, like, you know, again, this is my mom's mother's family, but my dad's family also, there's a little bit of that. They were in North Carolina mm -hmm. and they were on the Eastern side of the state. Mm -hmm. um, but there were a lot of like textile factories, like knitting factories. So there's this big sock factory <laughs> that my, she was my 
step great grandmother, who's my great grandfather, got married twice. Um, she had worked in a sock factory like all her life until she got married. <laughs> and, you know, it came out of the fact that there were all these sock mills in that part of North Carolina, you know, just like that there were cannon and sheet, you know, bedding and sheet makers were another area. Um, you know, and they had the same kind of stuff going on in South Carolina, just these all of these mills and these um I, I, factories like these knitting factories sprang up to to manage all of this and it was it was a big industry down there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow yeah it's um when you consider it's funny we go now we buy fat quarters and we buy this and not to say that people didn't buy smaller quantities or scraps but like this point in here the fabric was sold by the bolt the bolts 10 mm -hmm. or 20 yards i i can't imagine that now i know like i they'd buy that and then they'd make some dresses out of it and mm -hmm. they'd make shirts out of it and then maybe some pieces would end up in a quilt i still just can't wrap my head around that much yardage of one print <laughs> Unless it was, the, but, I only look at it as, unless it's the backing of a quilt, I'm going to get sick of it real quick. Well, but also, I mean, sometimes it wasn't a print at all. It was just a woven, you know, solid color. Well, no, no, I know. But I mean, like one, <laughs> one thing I would be like, wow, it's a lot. High water pants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so... She says in here, you know, she's talking about the National Recovery Administration. Um, I'm trying to remember. This is one thing I didn't mark, but I thought I wanted to. Um, hmm. Yeah, I can't remember what I was going to say about that. Uh, but I also, I have a book... Um, you know, if anybody's like really interested in this, they're those books that like, they're like the travel books. We're not really travel. They're about like it's Arcadia Publishing or Acadia Publishing, if you know that who that company is. They're the books that are about like towns yeah. or areas, and they're always like pictures, like old pictures. Mm -hmm. And it's, I guess, if you're like a historical society or just an individual person and you want to put together or something like that, this is the publishing company to go to. Um. I have the book for the town where my grandmother grew up. And of course it has a whole section about the mills and the bleachery. Um, but I also, my mom gave me a book that's sort of about, it, it's about the mills of South Carolina specifically. Uh, um, and I guess it's, it's encompassing the whole state and it's called Lint Head, <laughs> which apparently that sounds, is. That sounds like a nineties grunge band. <laughs> it does but at the time it was a derogatory thing to call somebody a lint really? head because yeah because it meant that you worked in the mill and they'd come out with like Covered bits of the lint. white fiber in their hair and all over hmm. um i mean just i mean you think like just like coal miners they come out with like you know hmm. their faces you know all smudged um it's the same thing and you're just covered in, in all the lint and of course again got all of these illnesses that come from the mills <laughs> and the bleachery um but it is so interesting that that book in particular linhead because they talk about you know the children of these towns it was because of these mills that some of these like again very rural we're talking appalachia in some cases like where my grandmother lived all the way to the coast um but they had baseball teams they had the you know uh, scouting troops they had all of these things that otherwise these little areas would have never had because of the poverty so it was the mill towns brought in um I guess I would call it like modernization to some, you know, a lot of these households, you know, that I, that maybe they wouldn't have necessarily seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. It's, um, it's definitely a twofold kind of history because without that industrial revolution, we mm -hmm. don't get to hear, um, but it's definitely not a pretty history, even though mm -hmm. some yes. paint it that way. <laughs> and the one thing that I, I did, I meant to, to mention here that I marked on page 136, um, middle column down at the bottom. Within the mill, most jobs were seg segregated by sex. Spinners mm -hmm. were always women, while men only worked in the card room, only men worked in the card room. Mm -hmm. Weavers included both men and women. 
but the women's wages were only 60%. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually surprised it was that much. <laughs> I just go back to the fact that, okay, if you can explain to me that, say, carding is harder than spinning, okay, pay the men more. That's fine. But when we're both engaged in the exact same job and you're going to pay me only 60 cents on the dollar, <laughs> ah, that does not, not cool. Like, why? Why? Look, there is nothing I mean, there. Um, <clears throat> are you arguing about that? In the eighteen, what are we? Where, where what year are we? I'm in? arguing about. I'm just arguing about the. But question. I'm but I'm pointing. You, the <laughs> argument you're making fits perfect into today. That's that's well. the point I'm making. You know, and the argument always goes like, well, women lose so much time because they've given birth to children and they've taken time off, and so their their <clears throat> career trajectory is such that they don't have as much experience. So yes, men in some jobs get paid more now. Whatever. But <laughs> this job, now I know weaving is, it's not like a mindless job. I mean, you have to have skill to do this. Mm -hmm. But why would men and women who are working together in the same place doing the exact same thing and presumably would have the same skills? Why are the women being paid so much less? Absolutely. It's just crap. That's all I have to say. It's just a bunch of crap. And I hate that. <laughs> And some things never change, right, you guys? Mm hmm Sadly. Although I was yeah. pleased to see in here, I don't remember exactly where, um, but the um, initiative to, because they worked, you know, six days a week, 12-hour days, and the mm -hmm. initiative mm -hmm. to bring them down to a 10-hour day. I'm actually surprised to see that in this time period at this point. But, like, you I know. know. <laughs> well, we're going we're gonna to roll it down to a 60-hour work week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, oh my gosh. You know, we complain now about it, like sometimes an eight hour work day, like just want you just, it just kills you because you're like, ah, I got nothing done. I had seven hours and 45 minutes worth of meetings today. Um, yeah, but some things just never change, do they? <laughs> I mean, to, to end this article on a little bit of a cheerier note, like this is like the cutest quote. Ever. Oh, I know. I love that quote so much. Of course you do. So adorable. I knew you would. And yeah. uh, this is um, a sampler coil piece in applique print and solid color cottons <clears throat> made by Winnie Marie Braze Brazeril Roper. I think it's Brazil, 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 Brazil. Whatever makes you yeah. happy. Um, <laughs> she's 1910 to 1980 with help from her sister, Clara, uh, in made Piedmont, South Carolina. Um, Winnie Roper worked for Piedmont Manufacturing for 37 years, filling batteries in the weave room. Clara Webb had a deformed hand and could not work in the mill, but she worked at home and took in sewing. Uh, pieced back, back to front edge, treatment machine sewn, white quilting thread, two to three stitches per inch. Bless her heart. <laughs> <laughs> But I thought but I was... love the fact that there was an old there's an older mm -hmm. quilt in the middle of it. I love that. And it's it's just so wholesome. It is. It's very cute. It's it's very like that time period of I mean, I can guess it's probably the the 30s. This is my guess. Because they don't give a date, do they? And Janet, yes, in terms of like making your work day less, fewer accidents if you're well rested, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. back, back before mm -hmm. there were all kinds of there was no OSHA <laughs> no regulations or anything like that but yeah on I guess that's gonna do it for us unless you have something yeah, else. yeah. yeah. you know we did not get into rayon but that's a whole nother topic because <laughs> she did talk about the rayon in the mills um mm -hmm. but it, that's something I only know a little bit about so um yeah the strikes I mean that that was a whole huge Thing. And it's funny because I, um, my last work that I did for my last corporate job, um, was on union stuff. I mm -hmm. had to do some union training, um, for, uh, the, the construction industry and just reading over that, the, the strike stuff, I was like, oh, well, that's so illegal <laughs> when they passed, you know, this law that changed. <laughs> <laughs>
So yeah, it's it's funny when like your professional life crosses into the things you love to do and informs you. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I am looking forward to our next two papers um, because the whole idea of, I guess, um, Esther Benberry's paper is very intriguing to me about cottage industries because there is, I feel like there's so much to learn. Um, you know, there's, there's so much to this story about cottage industry. So, and if, uh, if, yeah. if anybody came in late, just, just as a reminder next week for the 26th, we're reading the section on many hands group quilting <clears throat> and also all the other interesting places that you could find Steph or myself. You can find her on her Twitch stream, which is Mondays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. And uh, you're doing more stuff than just reading right now. Yeah, you're I have been. And I, yeah, I want to get back to reading because it is like the core of the, ch the channel, the stream. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we've been doing lots of different things. Mm -hmm. We looked at Arkansas quilts the other day. Was that, was that this Monday? Yes. <laughs> I said the other day. Yes, that was yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah I know what day it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then don't forget to follow Quilt Nerding on Instagram and Facebook. You can find me on my business page, JA Antiques and Vintage, which is on Instagram. I also have a YouTube that I sometimes will just post little videos of shopping things or a video that Stephanie made about the first antique show I did that she helped me out at. And then, you know, of course, we could end up popping up here. You just never know. We have you never know. coming in April. There's interesting things happening. Yes, I was I was large shopping today. What a weird statement. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got experimental archaeology happening. You guys are going to be like part of the audience for this, whether we That's do true. it live or have to do a video because it's it involves kerosene and. <laughs> that's fun. true we we are finally going to do the stuff with the um feed sack logos and the experimenting for the original ways for how to take the logos off the printing the flower sack printing mm -hmm. yeah it's and i i'm gonna get back to carding my own cotton you guys i've i've put that off too long i have to make a very small quilt <laughs> It's got its own hand cake made batting in it. That well, I mean, I should bring <laughs> I should bring mine when we go when we go in April to play with it. I exactly. should bring my trash. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Your bag of cotton trash that I mailed yeah. you. And did you guys know I mailed it to her and it was postage due? <laughs> okay. I, I wasn't gonna say that part, but it's that's like the best story. And when we're there, we're going to be doing a quilt turning with our friend Barb Garrett. Mm -hmm. That is going to be really exciting. Also, I am there to shop for the store. So you're going to see stuff that I am getting before anyone else sees it. And then Steph and I are also at going to the Lancaster Lebanon quilt show while we're there. Um, so we can get you some stuff from there to look at it's going to be a lot there's a lot yeah we have mm -hmm. a lot going on yes Yakamo. i expect you to begin um growing some flax <laughs> Yakamo, i remember that were you around when we were watching that video with mary about making fabric out of flax like you could do i it. remember that one yeah, yeah i remember that it. one it was good you could you could, you could yeah <laughs> All right, guys, that's going to do it for us. Thank you so much for, for joining and sorry that it was a pain in the butt to get on here tonight, but we did it. Yeah, we did it. Sometimes things are fooey, but that's just how it goes. We'll see you guys next week on the 26th. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs>